we'll, we'll see what happens. Uh, if he doesn't, then uh, we'll just fire away. So as you probably were, if you want to type a, a little question into the box, then I'll, I'll try and answer it specifically, but hopefully we can use that as a, as a prime to uh, get in touch with everybody else that's listening. Beautifully, says Angela. Splendid. Not, not many people call me that these days. I, uh, I played rugby for many years, and that's had its, uh, its scar, I think, both on, on my facial and bodily features. <laughs> I always think it's amusing when people stop playing rugby because they, uh, they, they, they maintain their weight, but it just redistributes. Anyway, uh, OK, a bit louder, says uh, John. I'll see if I can hopefully get that through. Um, okay, so let, we might as well kick off, I think. Um, I've called this, this presentation, uh, Funding the Future, a decade of change. I think really because of what's um, happened over the last 10 years in fundraising, it was really, I think, perhaps 10, maybe 15, 20 years ago, it was certainly something done by little ladies who had marmalade mornings and coffee mornings and bring and buy sales and things like that. But over the years, it has become a much more serious aspect of organization like parenting, of course, that, that you're very much involved with. Certainly a fascinating development has been in the school sector. Uh, probably in the 70s and 80s, the universities and the independent schools were the ones who were really concentrating on, on fundraising. But now it really is right across the board. And I think as, as my presentation will bring forward, there is far more competition out there for funds now. So the more we know about it, the more we can help hopefully help you uh, find research and, and get money to support your particular causes. OK, so uh, let's get up and going. I'll move my coffee cup out of the way uh, and move on to the first slide. OK, this is really just to give you a bit of background of who I am and, and what it's all about. Uh, as you're probably just picking up from my accent, I, I was born in Cardiff um, and moved up to the north of England, really, with, with the mining industry as it was at the time when I was nine years old. Um, I, I went to a school called Bolton School, which was an independent school, or is an independent school now, but was a direct grant school in those days. And, and I did very well there. It was a fantastic school to go to. I learned to play rugby. I went all over the world and really had, a, had an interesting time. I did OK academically and, and actually went to Manchester University, where my first degree was in biochemistry. I went from the university straight into medical research, actually, at the, the big local cancer hospital called Christie Hospital in Manchester. And we're talking a long time ago. We're probably talking about 1968 when I first went there. So you don't need to count the wrinkles because you can actually work out actually how old I am. Um, I, I, I spent about 25 years working on the development of new drugs trying to find if there was particular agents that were going to be successful against cancer. Really since then, we've only become aware how diversified a disease it is. And hence the idea of finding what you might call a magic dart, which would knock out cancer, was a rather naive approach. And sadly, many, many years work and a lot of scientific publications and papers didn't really help very many people with cancer. What was interesting was that I found that I had an interest in what you might call cancer education. I had the gift of the gab. I could go and talk about the work the hospital was doing and try and do something about the delayed presentation that people suffer from with cancer. In other words, they're frightened to death of the symptoms and won't do anything about it. And of course, as everybody knows, the earlier the disease is caught, the greater the chance. So we set up a situation of cancer education, in fact, and we started to go to rotary clubs and golf clubs and Masonic lodges and everything like that, trying to educate people about um, trying to educate people about cancer. As a result of that, people started to uh, bring in, uh, should we say, money for us. They did, they did fundraising things to help us. And we reacted to that and said, thanks very much. That's wonderful for what you've done. Um, and we ticked along quite merrily. And then towards the end of the, of the 80s, um, Great Ormond Street, which I'm sure you've heard of, started a most amazing appeal with a lady called Marion Alford, which was really successful in a proactive way. That was very quickly followed by the Royal Marsden Hospital and then by Edinburgh Children's Hospital. So the Christie Hospital looked at what the others were doing and said, well, why don't we be proactive? And eventually, I was the chosen one after a couple of sleepless nights, and I, I packed in my research altogether. I threw away my white coat, I bought a tie, they gave me an office and a computer, and there I was. Overnight, I became a fundraiser. 
And it was an amazing story. I should think over six years, we went from that one man start to a team of 15 raising, the team of 15 raising three million a year. It's continued to expand like that. The appeals department of the hospital is now 30 people and they're bringing in 32 million pounds a year. So it's quite a change from the from the, the situation it was, as you can imagine, in the late 70s to what, what it is now. And it's nice, I suppose, in a way to be to have been a part of that. And it certainly taught me an awful lot about relationships and, and what works in fundraising and what doesn't. And hopefully that, that will come out as we go on with the talk. I left the Christie mainly because I'd become an administrator in 95. And I got a call from my old school from Bolton School who recognized that they were going to lose what they call the assisted places scheme um, and they wanted to do something about getting money for bursaries and I was there for five years very successful built up a team again and we raised two million pounds to support the bursary fund I then found myself in a situation where everybody was asking me how I did it what I did at Christie and what I did at Bolton and I decided to pack it in basically stop having a salary and become a consultant and that's what I've done since uh, and it's been a very successful career from that including obviously in in a lot of seminars I have to say that this is my first webinar so I'm just wondering how this is going to go the main difference I'm noticing so far is I can't see you you can see me but I can't see you which is which is a rather strange situation but anyway we'll go through so now to look at the slide I am a consultant fundraiser I've worked with uh, crikey 100 200 charities I should think over the last 30 years I was the appeals director Christie Hospital the development director at Bolton School now there is an organization called the Institute of Fundraising which some of you may be aware of which is a, a very interesting thing to look at it's um it, it's actually got something like about two and a half thousand members now it's been around for 30 years and it's a very interesting website to look at they have their codes of practice and they have a lot of tips on, on different aspects of, of, of fundraising. So please do have a look at the Institute of Fundraising. Just, just put it into Google, um, uh, Institute of Fundraising, and it'll come up. And I think you'll find that quite an interesting website to look at. They have their own qualifications, of course, and I am a qualified member of the Institute. I was actually chairman of the Northwest Committee. Uh, about 15 years ago which I, I must admit I did find interesting as well and it gave me a good insight into all the, the different aspects that fundraising has okay moving on right I'm going to ask you a question I don't expect a deluge of answers on this it's really more um, a question for you to think about yourselves what what do you think fundraising is you know um, please if you want to offer me uh, ideas on what you think I think probably the simplest, of course, is fundraising, is to raise money to support a cause. But there's a bit more to it than that. And perhaps I could, I could go and just mention the Wikipedia definition, which is fundraising is a process of soliciting and gathering contributions as money or other resources, and that brings the in-kind donations, of course, by requesting donations from individuals, businesses, charitable foundations, or government agencies. The dog started barking. You might be able to hear it. <laughs> so that's the Wikipedia definition. I think I think it's, it's a very um, complex definition, but on the other hand, it covers everything. There are a lot of people now prepared to give in kind. A lot of companies, a lot of uh, retail agents, for instance, will give in kind. So if it's getting near Christmas, why not think about um, why not have to think about having a raffle at Christmas and maybe go to your local store, your Tesco, your Morrisons, uh, your, your Sainsbury's or whatever, and ask them if they'd be prepared to give you a hamper. I did this the last year for a small charity in Liverpool, and great, they gave me a hamper. must have been worth, well, I should think, 70 or 80 pounds with four bottles of wine in it. And I, I did a raffle and I raised 400 pounds, selling raffle tickets at a pound each. So, great, really was. Okay. Right, so let's talk a bit about what's happened in the last decade and how it's changed. I think, obviously, the biggest change, the biggest change is the internet. Uh, I'm sure you're all aware of this. That's why you're using this system at the moment. It really has transformed our lives, I think, doesn't it? it it's brought in the ideas of social media. It, it's brought in ideas of websites, hopefully, kept updated on a regular basis. And, and it's really transformed everything we do I actually bought my wife an iPad for Christmas I must admit and it's become a part of our lives it really has she does absolutely everything on it slightest thing straight to the iPad to find out what's going on 
So obviously, as far as um, we're concerned, as far as fundraising is concerned, then the role of the internet is crucial. And you'll see as we go on through the talks how important that actually is. I've put donor and alumni development. The reason I put those two together um, is because alumni is usually associated with schools. But it can be also associated with groups of people that support an organization in other ways as well. So your service users are basically your alumni in inverted commas. And what is crucial is that you keep records of them, what they're doing, what they're up to, if they've helped you in any way, how they've done that. And I think it's, it's really important that you have some sort of database or access uh, system which will tell you what they've done before because nobody has a memory that goes on forever. Uh, and as I get older, I seem to be forgetting more and more things, I must admit. But it is important to know who's done what and when they've done it and how they've done it. It's also important to look at business relationships. Nowadays, of course, charities are not on their own. There are a lot of people out there who are prepared to help. Um, there's rather a, an important thing called corporate social initiative, which um, or responsibility, CSR it's called, uh, which a lot of the big companies have now. And they have a, a certain budget put aside to support charitable objectives. And a lot of them actually have a CSR offices, whereby they are deputed to have that particular responsibility to look at the needs in the, in the community and to satisfy them with donations from the charity. So for instance, all the big stores, certainly Tesco, Sainsbury's, Morrison's, Aldi, Asda, everybody like that have their own local and national CSR departments. So always look to that very carefully. Again, it can be things in need, as I said earlier on, but a lot of them make grants in support of the local community. And in fact, if you go into your local store, into your local Tesco or whatever, and ask in the store, then they will tell you the right way to go about trying to get a grant. They're not massive amounts of money, but to smaller organizations, they can be extremely useful. So you can get £450 for, for a computer or something like that as a grant from the local Tesco community store. Worth thinking about. Facilities utilization, I, I've put this in because by utilization, I mean looking at what you've got and seeing if there is some potential income generation that you can derive. So in other words, if you've got a, a building if you, you, that you, you work from or offices, then there are people out there, local businesses, etc., who are looking for venues to have meetings, to have board meetings or something along those lines. So always look to what you've got and what you can use. Perhaps probably the best example of, of this is the schools, of course, who no longer switch all the lights off and lock up at four o'clock, but they actually open the school up. I must admit, at the time I was at Bolton School, it, it was amazing because we had more cars parked on the premises after four o'clock than we did before it. And all weekend, uh, the, the, the car parks were full, with the exception, of course, of the school minibuses, which were not parked there, but were being used to hire to bring in money from, uh, from the local community. So think about what there is there. And then finally, probably the, the most exciting and, and the biggest change has been the awareness that charities have of charitable trusts and foundations. There are something like 7,500 of these in the country. They all have different aims and objectives. They all um, support charity as part of their aims and objectives. Um, and they are well worth looking at, researching, and applying to. And this can apply to a one-man show or a big organization. It makes no difference at all. And what I'm going to try and do later on in the talk is concentrate upon the way you can research those, how you can find them, and the way forward. But what is important is that you do consider all the different aspects of fundraising. You'll find if you do start to look at charitable trusts and foundations, it can take an awful lot of time. But on the other hand, when you open an envelope and there's a check for £25,000 in it, that's happened to me very early on, well, that's one hell of a good feeling. It really is. Okay, so where are we now? Okay, we're supposed to be in a bit of a mess if you look around. I think if you listen to the television and certainly listen to the, the political parties. It's not an easy economic climate. And sadly, I'm afraid a lot of people are taking that aspect on and saying, oh, we can't give you any money because there's a depression on. Um, that is actually a bit of an easy way out, I think, in a lot of ways. What is interesting is that long-term investments have not been affected particularly by the recession. Um, there's no doubt that the interest rates of, of, of 
big long-term investments are still at the 6 to 8%. Certainly in, in property, for instance, investments in property will bring you a 6% return over, over 20 years at the moment. So it, it's definitely worth considering. Um, and there are concerns, because there's a lot of publicity about it, that charities are beginning to suffer quite a bit by the income and, and this, this environment in which we live. There's no doubt as well that um, the amount of money available is being more widely spread. In other words, there are more people applying for it, and I'll come on to that in a minute. But it is a situation that can't be dabbled at, and that's why I say charities and schools and any organization, whether they're charities or not, need to address this seriously. You don't have to be a registered charity um, to apply for money, but there's no doubt that it does help considerably, in fact, if you are. And in fact, of the charitable trusts, it's been calculated that about 86% of them will only support registered charities who apply. So that, that's, that's a good one because it's, it's worth knowing that. And it's a relatively simple procedure to go through. All you really need to do is to get onto the Charity Commissioner's website and it says quite e easily there how to set up a charity. So not a particular problem. Uh, you need about three or four trustees and they need to be aware of their legal responsibility. But it's not onerous. It's not onerous at all. Okay. I've got a question here. Are any of these funding streams available to local authorities? Yes, of course they are. Yeah, yeah. Local authorities are part of the growing number of, of organisations that are actually applying to these trusts for support. Obviously, the charity registration might be a bit tricky, but if you think of something like the lottery funding, I'll just give an example there. Um, the lottery funding is, is highly complex. There are different levels of it. The lowest of the levels, which you may have heard of, is, of course, called the Awards for All. Now, this is a, a grant that is given not to charity, to any organization. It can be the local scout hut, or it can be a school, or a, an organization concerned with parenting like yourselves, anything like that. And it has to be, come to, it has to be a single one-off project and has to be less than £10,000 in total. So you obviously need that to be costed very carefully, and you can do it online, and it takes about six to eight weeks to get an answer. And I've been extremely successful with these recently. Obviously, it's not it's not massive amount of money, but to some organisations, nine or ten thousand pounds is, is an awful lot. It mustn't go over ten thousand pounds, and that then opens up, if you're successful with that, the potential of other lottery funding. Uh, there is what's called the Reaching Communities Fund, which is from 10,000 to 50,000, and then the Building Communities Fund, which is over 50,000 up to 500,000, which of course is quite a sizable amount of money. All this is very clearly given on the uh, lottery, the Big Lottery website. Worth having a look at the Big Lottery website. It does tell you an awful lot, but that awards for all is a pretty good starter. It might seem a very complex application form, but if you think about it, the questions they ask are, are reasonable and the sort of questions that you would expect people to ask and they're suddenly going to give you eight or nine thousand pounds. So have a look at the, the lotteries fund. So where's it going in the future? Well, it's certainly come of age. I don't think it's better. It, 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 it can be denied of that. I do like income generation, not just because my company is called Income Generation Limited, but to me it gives a far broader sense of, of what it's all about. So we're talking about not just raising money from bring and buy sales, which is really what people think of as fundraising, but looking at major support for major projects that are going on. And hopefully it will cover the diversity that's there. As I've said, there is increasing competition and increasing professionalism. And there are a lot of, uh, of consultants like myself in the field who will actually do this for you, um, obviously for a fee because it's a profession, but they will do it for you and, and they are reasonably successful. A lot of the trust administrators who receive the applications and uh, pass them on either favorably or unfavorably to the trustees for the final decision uh, have become very professional in the uh, way that they assess so they know the sort of language that's needed and the emotive aspects which which are crucial to this not difficult to work it out as to exactly the sort of thing you need to say but on the other hand it's there and you have to be careful one or two little factors never do more than they ask you to if they ask you for 200 words, for God's sake, don't do 400 because that annoys them and it goes in the bin. Um, and we'll go around to some other visual attacks, uh, sort of attractions that you can put on the application 
which hopefully will make it more successful. We'll come around to that as we go on through the talk. Okay, um, it is hard work. It, it's graft, it's uh, concentration, it's sitting down in front of the computer. Many of the applications, as I say, can be done online. Um, if you do the necessary research, you'll find out that some can be written applications, some have written application forms, the, and more and more and more can be done online now. Um, but think about it around 50%, and that is perhaps rather generous, are turned down, mainly because they don't support the aims and objectives of the charity. These change in some cases quite rapidly. For instance, the Princess Diana Fund, which you're probably aware of, is very keen on, on the sort of the third world and supporting things like the, the, the finding the mines and things like that, the ground mines. But they do change their aims regularly, um, year to year. So you must keep up to date and find out exactly what's going on there. Okay. Um, as you can see, 50% of the income um, is divided with about 200,000 UK charities. So it's a lot. It's second only to one other aspect, which I'll come around to soon. And that, you may be surprised to know, is actually legacies. There's an example. Schools raise over 230 million each year from sources outside the main school budget. A lot of schools have been successful with the awards for all scheme of the lottery. And then a question, is it an art or a science? I, I once gave a, a full uh, hours lecture on this, trying to decide one way or the other. Uh, I was originally a scientist in medical research. So there is a certain scientific way to the way you approach these sources. Um, it needs introduction. It needs materials and methods. It needs um, some sort of results section and then conclusions at the end, which is actually the, the structure of nearly every scientific paper that's written. But on the other hand, it does need the artistic input. It has to have the emotive side of what, what you're talking about. Case studies are crucial to any application. If you've got examples of, of people who have benefited as service users from your organization and you can tell their story, then believe me, that does make a difference. Um, just to give you an example, my wife is actually the appeals manager of a children's hospice in, in Lancashire, a place called Derrien House Children's Hospice. And she wrote a story uh, which was quite tear-jerking. It was a story of a little girl who died, a seven-year-old who died at the hospice, and it was written through the eyes of the mother. It, it was absolutely brilliant, I have to say. I'm not just saying that because she's my wife. Uh, and it won an, an award from the Royal Mail through Direct Mail. Um, and it, 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 you get to the end of the first paragraph and you're in tears. It is incredibly emotive and very powerful in what it's doing. But I'm afraid, as far as fundraising is concerned, sometimes one has to be a bit mercenary, whether you agree with that or not. Um, and you have to adapt. Hence, you have to be diversified in, in the way you approach these things. Direct mail is an interesting aspect. Why, why do we get so many of these things through our post? I'm sure most of you throw them away. I, I do, I must admit. I keep the odd one just to see what it is. But they wouldn't send it if it wasn't successful. So do, do think along those lines. I mean, nowadays, of course, um, the internet is used incredibly for appeals and disaster appeals and, and things like the NSPCC and Cancer Research UK use an awful lot of this medium to broadcast their need. Not getting many questions at the moment, so hope you can hear me, but um, off we go again. So we've talked about the internet. Um, certainly, website development. Your website is crucial. It's now becoming the first point of call to a lot of people who, who want to know more about your organization. They'll go straight to, the, the, to your website. So make sure it's kept updated. OK, we can get into, oh, good, yes. People seem quite happy, so we'll keep going. Um, what is fascinating, of course, is that it's not just local now. It's worldwide. It's all over Europe. It's, it's in the States and everywhere else. And, and one thing I find very interesting is the way I suppose the worldwide communication has opened it up. Again, I'll come back to schools as an example, but it's not just schools. It's anybody that, that has people that have used the facility as a service user. So for instance, at Bolton School, the, the children that went there, a lot of them went out to America in the 50s and 60s. So they, they called it the brain drain, I think. Uh, I didn't go, probably because of the size of the brain. But a lot of my, my colleagues did uh, and were extremely successful. And when I was there, I, I went over to the States, actually. I managed to persuade the trustees that uh, it was worth doing. And we had a reunion. 
and we had 37 people from school who'd been to that school who turned up at, uh, at the Harvard Yacht Club in, in New York. Quite an amazing evening. And they pledged $120,000 that night to support the old school because they reckoned in their... Hello, everyone. Uh, it's Jimmy. I've just popped in to say I, I've, I'm not sure why we've lost David. Um, I'm just trying to get in touch with him now. So if you bear with us a couple of minutes, I'll, uh, I'll see if I track him down and, and get him back. He does st still seem to be in the room, in the virtual room. I just saw his cursor hovering over the screen. So um, I don't know if he can see or hear me. But um, I'm going to give him a call now and see if we can figure out what's going wrong. So um, thanks for your patience. Uh, we'll be back in a couple of minutes.
Okay. All right. Just remove my my phone from my ear. <laughs> okay. Okay. Are we on. Hello. Can you hear me? David is back. That's sounding good. That's sounding good. Right. Okay. I'm not really quite sure how much um, how much I lost. So I'll just go back one slide. I think um, just in case um, everybody followed what I said on the internet. It was very much just an echo. I think of uh, what I'd said earlier. Um, but think about actually using the website for appeals themselves. Uh, you can very easily put a, um, a, a site up there and ask people to make donations. Be aware of, of quite a few websites like Just Giving. I'm sure you must have heard of these, where people like Marathon Runners and things like this can sponsor individuals. Uh, any individual can set up um, a Just Giving site of their own for a particular charity or a particular organization. and um, it, 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 it is interesting. Uh, Claire's put school reunion. Not quite sure what what she means by that. But anyway, um, I was talking. Is that perhaps what I was talking about previously about New York? Maybe the fact that we went there and we got such fantastic response. Anyway, let's let's move back to where we were before, and we're on to regulation now. The comment fundraising is self-regulating is of course true, in that a lot of it's down to sort of personal ethical and, and moral judgments about what can and can't be done. Um, there's one particular aspect which is perhaps worth mentioning here, which is which is actually known as chugging. And those of you who live uh, near a, a big metropolis would probably have experienced this. And it, it's usually fairly young people, students, etc., who accost people, for want of a better word, in the street and try and get them to sign up to making regular giving to a charity. A lot of the big ones have taken this on, uh, certainly NSPCC, I'm aware, the lifeboats, etc., are doing it. And it's um, causing a lot of trouble with local authorities. Um, it's stopping people like the Samaritans and people like that doing their usual type of, of collections. Um, and it is, it is a bit of a nuisance. So when I say self-regulating, it's an interesting one because you may be aware that, of course, these people are, are on commission. All the people who are selling these uh, regular giving opportunities to the public, for want of a better word, are getting paid to do it. And in a lot of cases, some of the bigger charities have actually uh, treated it as, as a lost leader. Very interesting. In other words, they're saying, uh, you know, we don't really need to make money out of people actually signing others up. It's what happens in the future and that we've got them on our, our donor records, etc. Uh, and we'll be able to go back to them and sell them Christmas cards and everything else. But the actual commission that's given to the people who are selling them is more than the actual amount that's coming in. So that's what I mean by a lost leader. Very interesting practice, but upsetting a lot of people as well. I must admit, I, I don't have much time for them myself. The other thing which was which was interesting, um, without being too specific, was I actually was collecting for myself, for a, a charity I was working with, uh, on a street corner in the middle of Manchester, and I was approached, I think it's probably the best way to say it, by the local big issue salesman, who, who threatened me and said he was going to bring down his mates because I was on his patch. Um, and again, I'm afraid this doesn't really give uh, charities a, a very good name. It's probably an individual. I'm not decrying the big issue in what they do. They do a fantastic job. But some of the people that are involved um, uh, were a bit worrying. My response, by the way, just to tell you, was that I said I would go back and bring the first 15 rugby team down to, uh, to meet up with his friends. So uh, uh, they didn't come back. They didn't come back. Okay, so there are codes of practice, and again, look at the Institute of Fundraising website. There are do's and don'ts, a lot of them common sense, I must admit. There is also a new structure called the Fundraising Standards Board that's been set up. A lot of the big ones have joined into this, the big charities have joined with this, really because I think it's offering a bit of a safeguard. But of course, they, they charge for it. And I don't think at the moment it's caught on particularly with the smaller charities because literally they, they can't afford it. And I think the Fundraising Standings Board are hoping that every piece of literature that every charity puts out will have their logo on it uh, and their guarantees that everything is being done above board. But not actually um, hitting it off too quickly at the moment, that one. I think that's a, a watch this space. 
Okay, so let, let's go back to this business of, of the recession, etc. And, and, and does it actually mean that funders have less money? I don't think it does. I, I think it's it's more that there is more demand on that money, and therefore they're slightly more careful. The latest figures I can give you, they they. they very, very slow to come forward, a lot of these people, I'm afraid, on the statistics. But donations fell by 10% in, in 2011, which is quite significant, obviously. Uh, but investment portfolios were up by 19%. So that actually contradicts that. And that, as I've said a couple of times, um, charities, particularly debts, charity debt relationships, um, answer to the question will we get a copy of these slides I think yes if you actually my details are at the end of the presentation if you want to send me an email I'll very happily send you a copy of the slide presentation or I'm sure um, Jimmy would do that if, if you wanted to do it th through him so no problem there at all um, CSR I've mentioned this already is moving up the agenda now corporate social responsibility remember those words they're crucial okay well let's just go a brief overview of the potential fundraising sources that any organization has access to. First of all, we've got our grants, we've got the lottery, uh, we've got the corporate people giving away monies, and they all do it from Marks and Spencers uh, through to the banks, through to the insurance companies. If you look at their website, they all have particular um, aspects and uh, grants that they give to local community organizations, organize events. Um, Again, we're going back to our bring and buy sales and our marmalade sales. Uh, one thing that is quite interesting is a lot of um, uh, the clubs, the conservative clubs, the labor clubs, the working men's clubs, and particularly sports clubs, are finding life very difficult at the moment. People uh, seem to be preparing um, to stay in and watch their television. Um, so they're having problem getting people in. So if you organize a quiz night at the local pub, or something like a race night or a casino night, uh, and there are organizations that do this for you, then you can attract people to the pub or the club, and that makes the landlord from that point of view. You can actually have a membership fee. You can rely on public donations. There are collecting boxes you can get, and there are suppliers of those. Angle is probably the best one, or ECL Plastics is another one. Um, you can trade uh, through merchandising. Uh, through pens and pencils with your name on, through little beanies to put on Christmas trees. If you've got it, you can invest the money and get income from that. You can look at, at income from rentals or loan of assets. And obviously sponsorship is, is a possibility as well. And that, that's a lecture in its own right, really. But one thing I would add to that is obviously legacies. Uh, legacies are the biggest thing in charity. 70% of charitable income comes through legacies. And there's what's called a fundraising triangle, which is a, a theoretical organization where at the bottom you've got the one-off donors. As you go up the sides of the triangle, you've got the conversion of those one-off donors to regular donors, and at the top is the legacy. Never forget legacies, they are crucial. One interesting marketing fact, which you might like, is that if somebody leaves a money uh, in their will to charity, they actually live four years longer, which is quite a good marketing tool, as I'm sure you're aware. Lots of stories to tell about legacies. Uh, the most successful are probably the lifeboats in Birmingham. Who do you know has been rescued by a lifeboat in Birmingham? So it's, it's an interesting one. Uh, an awful lot of uh, marketing involved in that side of it as well. Okay, aware of the time, have lost a couple of minutes, so we'll keep, we'll press onwards. Okay, let's go back to the grant side. Um, the information is easily accessible. It's there on the website. You can go through Google, or there are specific sites, which I'll come around to later on and, and give you a list of those. Uh, some of them are free, some of them are subscription. There is, we keep on saying it, much greater competition for funds. You do need to work very carefully and very hard on this. You've got to do your homework. You've got to be organized, and you've got to be different. You've got to stand out from the crowd. And that rather sort of complex sentence or phrase at the bottom, you have to have a high public perception of what you're doing. Your profile in the local community is really quite significant as far as grants are concerned, as is all fundraising, of course. Um, and, and community involvement is, is very important to this. Um, this was particularly apparent in the education sector, of course, because, uh, again, with schools opening their doors more to the local community, that 
made them more aware of the local the local organizations that they could partner with and a lot of people are actually partnering if you go to a local school and say do you want to do you want to raise money and you've got an idea to do a quiz night with them you'll organize it use their venue and split the income between yourselves and them same applies to a sports club my own rugby club work very very closely um, with local charities etc where we have events uh, and we split the proceeds between the two it's it adds the emotive aspect to the rugby club and it brings in obviously a, a, actually a synergistic effect in other words it's not just additive to what would be brought in for the two organizations but because the two organizations are working together then you get more in the long term so certainly uh, worth thinking about the partnership ideas with local organizations and clubs and things like that okay what I'd like to do now is go into the, the sort of fundraising success factors these are some things which I, I think from 30 years these are the sort of conclusions I've come to you've got to be creative think you've got to think out of the box really you've got to be different um, you've got to be able to communicate that a lot can be gained from going to talk to local rotary clubs local inner wheel lions groups round table all these organizations they're often looking for people to go and speak to them so if, if they're looking for speakers, just go onto the internet, find out where the, the local Rotary Clubs are, write to the secretary um, and say you'd be happy to come along and give them a talk about what you're doing. And there's a pretty good chance from my own experience that they will make a donation to your organization at the end of it. You've got to be a marketing person and you've got to be IT savvy, obviously. Your press and media contacts are really important because they're the way you get the message out there, hopefully without having to pay too much just tell you a little story of that, that happened about how the importance of, of, of press um, um, from that point of view in that I was working for a charity which changed its name actually um, from the Boys and Girls Welfare Society to an organization called the Together Trust and my view was that the Together Trust didn't exactly portray what that organization was doing so I had to raise the public profile of it so what I decided to do was to have a balloon race um, and get the local press to come along and see all the balloons be released from the net um, and, and go as far as, as they could possibly be blown. The actual winner was sent back from Brazil and I had a nasty suspicion that someone might have gone on holiday and taken it with them but uh, uh, it was probably Norfolk was a better bet as to the winner who, who the winner was but what we decided to do was invite the local mayor down uh, along with the press of course to release the balloons um, and the local mayor came down she's quite a big lady actually um, dainty ankles and she released the string but unfortunately the net got caught on her, her mayoral chain uh, around her neck and she found herself actually going up off the ground she was running across the field um, and, and going across the ground and there were about seven or eight besuited people following her who actually did did bring her down there was not a major problem but it made the front page of the local paper and everybody knew about the together trust after that can you talk about national and local folks? It's always easier to raise funds. Yes, yes, of course. Um, well, let's go back to the grant side of it. Um, certainly, when I talk about grants, it's very interesting because there are obviously a number of, very apparent that that slide's come up now, there are a number of apparent funders uh, on a national basis, but there are far more on a local basis. If you do your research, you will find that there are geographically locations to a lot of charities charitable trusts um, and that is actually when I'm researching a trust is the first place I look because there is no point in applying for a trust to support a, a charity in, in, in Cardiff or Liverpool when they only support the borough of Hackney for instance and there are a lot like that so that's the first place to look really when you're looking for this information there are a lot of new trusts being set up mainly through uh, people leaving estates to charity as you know when somebody dies they leave a legacy and the executors then determine if that is the want of the of the testator that the money will be distributed to whatever charity they think appropriate so you can actually apply for that to the executors of the charity a lot of them are because the the property aspect of, of the estate is now much higher therefore there's a lot more should we say left over almost as a residual legacy after the children and the local cat etc and the bird have been looked after in the will so be aware of that and it's worth going to talk to the local solicitor the senior partner of the local solicitor will be aware of, of legacies that have been left to support the local community I have a number of examples of that I won't go into a lot of details I haven't got the time but it, it really does work 
work and and that's the way to get your local projects through local trusts okay apply to the bigger ones as well certainly apply to Lloyd's TSB uh, the banks Barclays HSBC they all have their own trusts that will support the local aspect I hope that that helps Catherine's question from that point of view okay so what does this slide say you can't guarantee success just be a bit aware that that your your, your bosses should we say for want of a better word don't have over expectations I've worked for a number of charities where they think within six or eight weeks we can get a lot of money in it doesn't work like that it requires a lot of graft a lot of time and you have to plan ahead the people who make the decisions as to how the money has to be given are often amateurs they meet on an irregular basis a lot of these trusts the trustees meet every six months or every year or something like that some of them more regularly but some as, as, as long as that so you've got to know that to know when you want to implement whatever award you're successful in getting so be aware that it does take time for these things to happen you've got to have the resource you've got to have the time um, that has, you obviously need the computer etc to set aside and it's so easy to give somebody within their job description say a couple of hours a week or something like this to, to look at, at fundraising and it that is a disaster it doesn't work you have to put the resource towards it and it has to be uniquely towards it as well okay external factors that will make it successful or not as the case may be uh, as I said earlier community involvement is, is crucial whatever uh, hopefully in a lot of your cases that you will be involved in the local community anyway as your service users where you are is crucial certainly in a lot of trusts again as I've said earlier it's, it's interesting when you do these presentations because everything comes up twice usually which is very interesting obviously the local wealth of the, of, of the economy wherever you are and the areas of deprivation now a lot of these these grant applications are enhanced should we say by using local statistics uh, obviously the census is available until the latest sentence is not that long ago that information is available but if you look at the local council stats you will find a lot of the, the these deprivation statistics and one thing I find quite satisfying sort of satisfying in one way but interesting in another is that I did some research recently and you can actually show that places like Windsor and Balmoral are areas of deprivation in certain areas you know in certain aspects so for instance you might immediately think of, of, of South London or, or Newport in South Wales as, or Merseyside, Birkenhead in Merseyside as being particularly areas of deprivation but if you look carefully you can pick out stats which will support your application from that point of view um, do look at the local business infrastructure there are an increasing number now of networking organizations uh, it seems to be the in thing in small and medium-sized businesses uh, and you can go along to their meetings it's like 10 pounds a head or something like that it's not a lot you can go along and, and, and give a talk about what, what it's all about um, breakfast clubs are particularly uh, keen on these days I must admit I'm not at my peak at breakfast time but some people seem to enjoy them uh, and you can go along and do a three or four minute presentation to all the other people that are there uh, I did this with a charity fairly recently and um, it was just before Christmas last year and we just launched our first range of Christmas goods wrapping paper Christmas cards things like that um, and I went to this little meeting and told everybody there and about six of the local companies immediately bought Christmas cards which, which was great so think about that think about as I said before think about rotary uh, in a wheel etc um, there are fears I'm afraid that it is an aging structure but on the other hand they, they are very generous people and they do get involved very much so we're just approaching the season where I'm sure most of you will will come across rotary clubs with Father Christmas on on a lorry etc let's let's move on that's something I don't do despite people wanting me to <laughs> you have to have leadership and you have to have the freedom and ability to take risks uh, you need access to skills and expertise including project management and marketing this sounds pretty broad I know and it's probably aimed at, at the larger organizations but equally applies to a one-man show um, you do need active management from wherever uh, don't get yourself in a situation where somebody says oh we need this go and fundraise for it because it's not quite as simple as that you need their input you need input as far as costing is concerned and budgets etc um, and as I say have a designated fundraising person uh, and give them time and you've got to have a, a senior level commitment a commitment throughout the organization to what you're trying to do uh, fundraising is not just a slight aside um, that people perhaps uh, put some time to when they've got it 
it doesn't work like that. Believe me, it does not work like that. Okay, you've got to have your priorities, um, and they've got to reflect the needs of your members, your customers, your community. In other words, your, your service users. Um, look at what's gone before. Um, a lot of people get plunged into a bit of a morass on this, in that they go to work for an organization, um, really to look, I suppose, more at, at I don't know, at what's happened before, say, five years ago. They might have been a completely different structure, but they might have applied to Esme Fairburn Trust or something like that and got a big grant, and you're not aware of it, and nobody who works there now is. So be prepared to look back and see what you can find there. Um, you've got to invest, obviously. There has to be speculation to accumulation. Um, and I always sort of ask this question again, have a think about it. If we were to meet one year for today, where do, you, where do you think you will have got? Will you have actually done anything? Will you have had the, the ability to get anywhere? Right, um, just to answer a couple of questions, to answer Catherine and the latest question, uh, I'm coming to that in a minute. Um, there are various sites which I'm going to give you details of that you can get hold of. And then, yeah, applying for funds for projects on, on, on a national focus. Again, look at the at the banks and the insurance companies and people like that. Certainly, I found the Lloyds TSB people are very, very helpful. Go on the website. There are regional um, uh, individuals who help and are really helpful on the telephone. Um, definitely use the telephone as much as you can. The only time you don't use the telephone is if it says on their website, don't phone. It's as simple as that. So, so keep going and look at that as much as you can and, and use that telephone. It can be very useful. Another, another interesting organization is Santander. Since they took over Abbey, they've set up regional committees now who look at local, um, local organizations and then recommend to head office that they give money. Sainsbury's, again, there are a number of trusts associated with Sainsbury's, which, again, is worth looking at. Do we have access to the training manual? Um, not quite sure what you mean by training manual there. Anyway, we'll, we'll come back to that hopefully and, and see what see if you could enlarge um, what you're doing. Yeah, uh, interesting. Does this count for social enterprise? Yeah, there are, as a lot of you will be aware, there are what are called CICs or community interest companies being set up now. This really came out of the idea that um, charities can't trade as such. So the whole aspect of income generation associated with charities, when I say they can't trade, they can't trade above a certain level. I think it's about 82,000 at the moment. Um, but it's very much a case that CICs are being set up to get over that problem and are much more commercially orientated uh, as social enterprises to take things forward. So hopefully that answers um, Ruth's comment. Certainly a lot of them are, can apply to the charitable trusts in the same way that charities can. No problem at all. In fact, I'm involved with setting one up myself in Liverpool on that. Okay. Right, what I, what I want to do now is just concentrate a bit more on the actual application itself and hopefully give you a bit more information on that. Grants information is available from a multitude of organisations. Some you pay for, some it's free. Uh, you've got to be a bit careful because the result is information chaos. Or if you don't know where to look, it's information starvation. You've got to use that internet again. I'm coming back to that. It's up to date, it's accessible, and you've got to be web savvy, and you've got to be informed early on if they change their particular aims and objectives, as I mentioned with the, the Princess Diana Fund. Um, always keep a list of the previous grants that have been awarded. Um, you can use grant application forms and guidelines. A lot of the websites of, of the trusts and the, the corporate bodies actually have a list of previous grants. Certainly the lottery do. You can look at the people who've received awards for all grants and what they've received it for. Uh, and the reaching and, and building communities as well. Look at the statistics about your local area. And then, as I say, as I'm coming round to, which I'm sure a lot of you have been waiting for, we come to the grants databases themselves, OK? They are electronic records of grant sources. Some are free, some by subscription. And they allow detailed searches for grants information. Some of these organizations have free tasters that you can use. And you've got to go down this route. It really is a worthwhile investment. If you look at just one or two of them here, um, probably the most interesting one is the bottom one, uh, which, is, which is grants online. .org.uk. They give you a free trial. I think it's 28 days to look at that, and then you can subscribe on a regular basis. 
what they do is they produce regular online updates of any changes, names, objectives of charities, or they have information about what the geographical limit is or anything like that. And then after, if you decide to subscribe to it, then you're talking about uh, probably about 280, 275, 280 pounds a year to receive regular, regular sort of updates um, in time. Very useful. That, that I find that one incredibly useful. Um, Funding Central, yeah, uh, that's free to anybody, any third sector organisation. In other words, not for profit. Um, the, the J4B community is an interesting one. Uh, again, you can do free grant searches. And then if you've got the word eco in any way associated with what you're doing, then you are green and you've got a 20% greater chance probably of getting funds because of the eco aspects of what you're doing. So those are just four. There are a lot of others and, and do your research and, and find them. But have a look, have a serious look at the grants online. That, that really is good. There is a similar one, if, if any of you are associated with, with the education, there's one called Grants for Schools, which is particularly appropriate. There's also a separate one called uh, Funding for Sports, if anybody is associated with, with sports clubs and wants to, to do that. And again, think about that partnership idea. Uh, we've got it. Uh, here we are. I don't know whether I'll be emailing anything, but I, I think Jimmy is going to send out um, copies of the of, of the lecture, of the presentations to people afterwards so, in answer to that. Right, set up a grants library. Um, a lot of these, these, these big um, charitable trusts have their own newsletters. Have a look at those, see where they're giving the money and see what feedback there is afterwards. What is really very important is a lot of these people monitor um, what money they've given and, and, and how it's being spent and then put it in the newsletter so people can see the good work they're doing. Philanthropist is, is a lovely word, but um, right, thanks, Jimmy. I appreciate that. Um, but again, it, they do like to see their name in print. And it's something I found the psychology of fundraising is very interesting that uh, if somebody has a duck race on the local river, they love to see the picture in the newspaper. And if they get the picture in the newspaper, they'll do it again. <laughs> Coordinate your information, uh, set up an email group, and don't forget the deadlines of, of the decision-making process with these different trusts that you're applying to. Here's just one or two to show you the amount of money we're talking about. Probably the biggest in this country is the Esme Fairburn Foundation, who give away £29 million a year to organisations. Incredible, isn't it? The Paul Hamlin, they give £20 million tends to be education bias them. The Wolfson Foundation gives 35 million. Again, a bit of a, a scientific bias there. Uh, so if you're thinking of sort of ecological or, or environmental aspects, then that would be a good one. Uh, Claude Duffield are very keen on, on young people going on, uh, on trips and things like that, as are Ernest Cook. Um, they support things like the, the yachts that take disabled children and, and blind children on trips and things like that. So that's just one or two ideas, just really to give you some idea of the sort of levels we're talking about with these things. The corporate foundations I've touched on, Santander, Alliance and Leicester, Bradford and Bingley, um, Community Chess. Um, a lot of these now are done rather by, than by the organization. They're, doing through some, they're done through something which is called a community foundation. Some of you might have heard of those. Community foundations are groups that are set up Greater Manchester Foundation, the Merseyside Foundation, the Quadrant in Bristol. These are all examples of community foundations. And people like the co-op, for instance, give their charitable donation monies to the community foundation to sort it out. So you get hold of the community foundation and find out what their priorities are and all the grants that they administer. Comic for Relief, for instance, is, is administered through um, community foundations. And you submit your application to the community foundation, who then take it on and decide the best people to, to send it to after that. OK, let's get around to some of the skills themselves. Um, how to stand out from the crowd. What do you need to do? There are three golden rules to this, in my view, very personal view. Write in plain English. I'll show you what that means in a minute. Use active language and have a strong visual impact in what you're trying to put over. 
So tell them a story. Try to engage them. Write about people, not things. I come back to what I said before. Again, think about case studies. Think about people who've benefited from your organization and use that information, obviously with their permission. Uh, if there are photographs involved, you're slightly careful about that, obviously, um, and get plenty. make sure you've got parental permission, etc., before going forwards. Try and paint a picture of the organization. Um, be different from everyone else. Differentiate yourself from what everybody else is doing. Be unique and make them actually want to fund you. Put that emotive aspect into it. Always avoid the reject pile. Some applications are rejected because they contain poor ideas. Most applications are rejected because they contain good ideas, poorly presented. And that presentation aspect is really, really important. OK, the rules for success. Understand the priorities of the organization you're applying to. Make sure that you're up to date with what they do. Have your project clearly defined, know exactly what's going on, and have it costed. Whatever you do, don't send something that looks like a circular. In fact, I would always say, just as a little tip, then if it's a, a typescript on a black on white paper or whatever, then sign it in blue. Say dear in blue, find out who the actual person is. Don't say dear sir or madam. Go on the, in on the internet and find out who the contact person is and sign it in blue. And if you can, a, a tip I picked up a few years ago is, Put a PS on as well. You put a little PS at the bottom to say, you know, little Johnny could benefit incredibly from your help. People will read that first before they read the application. So if you can catch them with that PS, they'll then read it in detail. Just a little tip. <laughs> Plain English. Now here's, a, here's an example. Okay, it's taken from education, but it's an example of what plain English is all about. Just just read that sentence. If, you're, if you've received an application and you find that high quality learning environments are a necessary precondition for the facilitation enhancement of the ongoing learning process, blah, blah. Isn't that amazing? And what does it mean? What is it actually saying? It's saying children need good schools. That's all it's saying. Think about this very carefully. There is, if you fancy a bit of bedtime reading, have a look at this website. It's absolutely fascinating. It really is. Sadly, a lot of a lot of organisations are, are, are full of jargon. Medicine and education, which have been, I suppose, the two main aspects of my life to date, are full of jargon. So try and avoid it because people won't know what you're talking about. Uh, writing clear, bold sentences. Um, avoid long, difficult to read prose. I would suggest. If you do an application, get somebody else to read it, someone who is not um, relevant to the organization you're applying for, someone, someone down at the sports club or at the fitness center or, or even Great Aunt Maud or someone like that. Get them to read it and just see if they're happy with, with the way it's been doing. And have a look at that website. It, it, there's absolutely amazing things on there. There really are. Use active language. Uh, be persuasive and positive. Um, don't say that if we get your money, we hope to do this or that. Say, you're going to do it. You're going to do it, definitely. Is there a general rule on length and applications, or does it vary from trust to trust? Ask Catherine. It varies tremendously from one to another. That's why you need to look very carefully at what they're actually asking for. Um, their application forms will have boxes with not to check a certain number of words or whatever. Normally, my rule of thumb is if you're doing a written application, is no more than four sides of A4. Okay? You can put additional material in. Don't put too much in. The odd photograph, no harm in putting that in. If they want more information, they will ask for it. If they want copies of your accounts or whatever, they will ask for it or your, or your policies of safeguarding or equality and diversity or health and safety and all these different things. If they want that, they'll ask for it. So don't send a great big envelope full of stuff. Just put a basic application in. One thing I'm very keen on doing is what they call a case for support, uh, which again is, is another lecture in its own right, really. But a case support goes into the background, it identifies the need, it discusses the budgets, and it's used as a generic document for applications. So in other words, you can cut and paste from a case for support to a particular application. Okay, So they do. They do vary in length and um, and content quite considerably. Their questions are sometimes not that easy to answer because they're very general. Um, but if you, if you get down and I would say you want probably about three to four hours 
uh, just just solely on, on an application to make sure you've got it right and everything is in there. Okay. Okay, think about the visual aspect of what you're doing. Um, always think about the person who opens it. I mean, think you may be a situation where a trust administrator gets something like 30 letters one morning. And, and I'm being realistic there. That is the number of applications they're getting. She might have had a row with her husband over breakfast and be in a really bad mood. And she opens the first one, and, and all this, all, every paragraph is a single sentence. There's no spaces between the paragraphs or anything like that. And it, it really is a nightmare to try and read it. So it goes in the bin. It, it, it really does. I know I've spoken to people. I know this happens. Use bullet points to break up your text. Um, think about it as a, as a visual impact document, not just a story. You need to tell a story, fine, but try and break it up so people can focus. The chances are, if it goes to trustees, for instance, it will go to someone who is a specific expert in, in, in the accountancy side. So make sure that that is, it has a subheading and people know exactly where to look when they're looking for accountancy details. Uh, use bold text to, to highlight some of your statements. The subheadings are really important, actually, so people can go back to look at certain sections if they think, oh, I didn't, didn't he or she cover that earlier on in the document, and, and go back and have a look at that. So subheadings, yes, every time. Okay, that really is about it. It's um, nearly quarter past one. I think I've been going perhaps slightly longer than I should have done, so I do apologize for that. It's a vast subject. I, I hope I've managed to cover it. I'll, I'll leave that slide up, and that will be in the information that's sent on to you. If anybody wants any, any help or anything like that, then, then please get hold of me, and, and I'll do my best to help. Um, I hope there's some reaction. It, it's rather difficult when no one says anything out loud, but it's uh, been interesting from my point of view. I need a glass of water now, I think. Thanks very much indeed. Thank you. Yeah, no problem, no problem. Ah, I'm back. I've appeared on screen. I, think. I, I was just beginning to type. Thank, <laughs> thank you very much, David. I just, I did just <laughs> want to pop up and say thank you, and um, yeah, sure. and just let let everybody know that you're that you're here um, for questions if there are any more. Sure. Sure. Yep. Um, I, I lost my audio visual for a while there, so I just I could just see this rotating ring hovering, saying, "No, no, yep. no, we're not going to let you back in." And I had this terrible fear that I would have to conduct the Final roundup by uh, by text, yeah. but I'm back. Um, well, so thank you very much. Actually, and, looking uh, at some of the comments there, they seem to get a good reaction. Um, yeah. Somebody's asking we can, about we the, can leave um, the room open for a, for about ten minutes. Yeah, or someone's so. asking about that fundraising triangle. It's actually in a in a in a book by a chap called Ken Burnett called Relationship Fundraising. That's where it came from originally. It's, um, it's, it's it, you know there's no more than that to it. It's just very interesting theoretically. I'll, I'll see if I can get a put a response to that. I can find it. There weren't that many to sort of pick up on as we went through, which wasn't too bad, I suppose. There it is. Can we have a copy of the fundraising trial? What was it? Oh, right. OK. I'll see if I can answer that. Um, You can answer out loud, David. We're still on. They oh, okay, can hear okay. us. Okay, um, it's an answer to, to Matt, actually. Um, the £280 per year is the fee that people pay to the grant um, information suppliers, like grants online and things like that. That's what that is, after the free, free period that they get. Um, the Fundraising Triangle, there's a, there's a book by a chap called Ken Burnett called Relationship Fundraising. Um, who first came up with the idea, crikey, it must be 
nearly 20 years ago now. As I say, it's the conversion of the one-off donor to the regular and then ultimately the legacy at the top. Um, there's so much, so many other things. I could, I could spend at least two hours talking about legacies. <laughs> Some of the statistics, as I say, are absolutely fascinating on, on legacies. They really are. Um, but I hope that answers Matt's question anyway. Uh, are there any others I should be looking at? Let's have a look. I don't think so. Most of them Lots of thank yous, but I haven't seen any other mm. questions that you haven't already addressed yet. Oh, there's one in from Anna Person oh, who says, are there particular credentials required of a CIC before applying for funding, i.e. Yes. X years of <laughs> operation? Oh, no, no. Um, usually, organizations need to have been in existence about two years. Um, but that's 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 really for I'm just trying to think of, of an example of that. Yeah, I'm I'm working for one of the new academies in in South London, uh, which has only just been set up in September, and we cannot do that until we've been in existence for two years. Whether that's a rule of thumb, I don't know, but that's certainly the reaction I got on on the CIC basis there. It, it's got to have you know sort of accounts for two years and things like that. Normally, um, uh, charitable trusts that I've been talking mostly about will not require that, provided you've got evidence of accounting and not necessarily audit, just good accounting structure. Uh, that's all they require. Um, so probably you've got to be running about six or 12 months, I would have thought, before you got that anyway. Um, but most people will, will be in that situation. I hope that helps on that. Um, there are, again, if, if you look at, at the CIC information um, the, on, on the website, it, it's all there. Very, very comprehensive, in fact, as, as the Charity Commissioner's website is extremely helpful um, from that point of view. And what you can do on the Charity Commissioner's website, if you want to set up as a charity, is, is look at other organisations that have done that, look at their uh, particular criteria of, of the areas they serve, their aims, objectives, etc. Uh, and I'm a great believer in plagiarising. I really am. You know, why not? Done it for my own rugby club. <laughs> Voluntary organisations, crikey, again, <laughs> another lecture. There are a number of voluntary organisations. There is an increasing um, emphasis, I think, placed on universities, certainly in universities in the academic sector, for their undergraduates um, to get involved in volunteering. There's the CVS, uh, the Council for Voluntary Services. Uh, each local um, community normally has its volunteering services I think then they, they do a lot of um, seminar presentations. They also have things like notice boards, um, website notice boards, that anybody looking for volunteers can, can put that up. I, I would strongly suggest, and what I found very successful, is to go to the universities themselves, talk to the universities. They're looking, in some cases, to actually place people as undergraduates uh, for the projects. Uh, it can be six weeks, it can be six months, it can be a year. And I've used that facility a lot, actually. Um, sometimes I have to pay them expenses. Sometimes, if it's a longer period, a nominal amount, but certainly for the six week placements, and you can do a lot in six weeks, in six weeks placements, it, it's free. And uh, these people, it's great for them because they're adding to their CV and that's going to help them get employment eventually. So it's, it's a win win situation for all, all sides. Um, there are a lot of the, the, the volunteer organizations, certainly. Yeah. Sorry, I didn't have time to cover everything, I'm afraid, but uh, that, that's one aspect. There is a good website, by the way, called. Um, uh, volunteering England. I don't know whether you've seen this. Uh, just www.volunteeringengland, which goes into a lot of the aspects of volunteering. Uh, a lot of organisations now have um, uh, actually agreements, volunteer agreements, because there have been one or two problems on employment issues of people who've been volunteers uh, and, and then sort of class themselves as, as employers. So you do need some sort of statement or agreement with a volunteer that they come on board. You also, of course, need to think about references as well for them. Uh, very important, that side of it. Which is better application? Should have a collaborative partnership involvement? So, oh, cracky. It, it's 50-50, the answer to that, I'm afraid, uh, in answer to Claire. Collaborative partnership, yep. If you've got community, I, I keep on coming back to it, I know, I'm sorry about that, but it's the community involvement which is important. If your major project that you're applying for support has community support and, and benefits the community that you're involved with, then that's fine, that's great. And the more people you can show to, to benefit, the better. Uh, I'm trying to think of an example. Um, 
I, I have I work for a charity which is concerned with visually impaired children uh, and what we're doing actually is we're trying to teach the community to get involved in visual impairment awareness okay the idea here is that people in supermarkets and taxi drivers and people like that are not aware of the needs of visually impaired people so what we're doing is and we've actually got a lottery grant to do it is we're setting up training courses with local supermarkets etc etc where the staff are taught visual awareness and, and really that that was an absolute peach as far as the lottery we concerned they loved it because there were community involvement right across the board and the visually impaired people were being seen to benefit and so was everybody else so again a win-win in every respect there are some sole applications which are strong as well, yeah, uh, with a strong workforce. But um, it, it, it's very difficult to define and say one or the other. There's the equal aspects to all of them. You want to get any more, do you think? 